Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture in the topic of STEMI and today we are having like a resume lecture for query ECGs for STEMI. In this lecture we are going to learn the query and equivocal ECGs that are not frankly appearing as STEMI but should be recognized as STEMI because sometimes they are easily missed and interpreted as just non c elevation acute coronary syndrome. So here we are collecting a lot of the query patterns that we have learned before in the previous lectures in one lecture. Let's see this diagram here. We know, of course, this diagram for the coronary anatomy. We can see here the left main bifurcating into LED and LCX, and we can see the right coronary artery. Sometimes the occlusion leading to the, the culprit vessel are some of the vessels that are supplying the posterior wall or lateral wall, and so sometimes they are not frankly appearing in the ECG. Like, for example, the PDA of the RCA, sometimes the OM branches, OM first or second, sometimes the LCX proper, the diagonal branch, the RV branch, or sometimes if the patient is post cappage, sometimes the occlusion is in the saphenous venous graft or the radiograph graft to the RCA, to the BDA, to the diagonal, or to the OM. So the graft itself may be the culprit vessel. So we have some query ECGs that may appear as confusing for many cardiologists in the ER, but they should be interpreted as a STEMI. So for case in case of occluded LCX, occluded diagonal branch, occluded OM, occluded PTA, posterolateral venous or arterial graft, the patient may present without frank ST elevation. And so unfortunately, is denied reperfusion therapy resulting in larger infarction and worst outcome and the increased risk of rhythmic complication, mechanical complication and whatsoever. So remember, suspicion of ongoing myocardial ischemia is an indication for primary PCI, even in patients without diagnostic ST elevation. And that's why the clinical sense is very important and sometimes maybe even more important than the ECG itself. Don't depend on the ECG only. You should also combine your clinical sense. Let us start with the hyperacute T wave, which of course is detected when the T wave amplitude is more than two thirds the complex amplitude, and this may precede ST elevation in patient presenting very early after symptom onset. We know, of course, from the normal ECG, the T wave amplitude is measured from the baseline to the peak of T wave, and usually it is less than two thirds and more than 10% of the R wave amplitude, and the normal T wave usually measures less than five millimeter in limb leads and less than 10 millimeter in precordial leads. When I see an ECG like this, I can see here there is hyperacute T wave, but the ST segment is still isoelectric. So here, of course, we know that this patient, if I repeat the ECG after about 15 or 20 minutes, he would develop ST elevation. So I should not wait till the ST segment is elevated. I should proceed this patient to the primary PCI. Here, another example in which there is hyperacute T wave and the ST segment is evolving or trying to elevate above the isoelectric line. So here, of course, this patient should be considered as anteroceptal STEMI, not just hyperacute T wave. So any patient with chest pain and hyperacute T wave, he should be considered as STEMI. Another one is the RV infarction. We learned before that the ECG signs of RV infarction are the ST elevation in the right precordial leads, magnitude of ST elevation more in lead 3 than in lead 2, and the ST elevation in V1 more than 2 mm. We know that the most famous way to perform right ECG leads is to put the ECG precordial lead in the mirror image to the standard left-sided ECG lead. And there is another easier way, which is to move V4, V3, V5, V6 to the right side of the chest and leaving V1 and V2 at the same place. So V4, of course, is the most important one of them. And here in this ATG example, we can see that V4, 5, and 6 have been moved to the right side of the chest, and they are showing ST elevation as a sign of RV infarction, together with inferior STEMI, as we can see here in the limb leads. So here is a patient having inferior STEMI and RV infarction. There is a much simpler way, which is moving V4 to the right side of the chest, leaving the other five precordial lead. So V4 right would be in the right left centricostal space in the mid clavicular line with a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 78% to diagnose RV infarction. Here is an example for this, in which the patient has inferior STEMI and is having ST elevation in the right V4, which was the only lead to be moved from the precordial lead to the right side of the chest. So we have three ways to perform right ECG. 
The second sign of RV infarction is the magnitude of ST elevation in lead 3 more than in lead 2. And we understood why, of course, because the axis of the RV infarction will be directed more towards the positive pole of lead 3 than to lead 2. And so here we can see that the magnitude of ST elevation is higher in lead 3 than in lead 2, which is considered as a sign suggestive for RV infarction. The third sign is the ST elevation V1 more than 2 mm, and this indicates, of course, that the patient is having transmural infarction of the anterior wall of the right ventricle. And the absence of ST elevation in the other precordial lead rule out anterior MI. So here in this ACG example, we can see evidence of inferior STEMI together with ST elevation in V1. And so this is suggestive of inferior STEMI with RV infarction. Here in this example, we can see the inferior STEMI together with ST elevation both in V1 and V2. And so it is also a sign of RV infarction and it should not be considered as combined anterior inferior STEMI because here the other precordial lease doesn't show any ST elevation. And here we can see an evidence of inferior STEMI together with isoelectric ST segment in V1 and ST depression in V2, which sometimes may occur with RV infarction. And of course, this is not posterior infarction, as here it is just ST depression without prominent R wave. So of course, RV infarction is usually associating inferior STEMI, and rarely it may be isolated if the culprit artery is only the RV branch, like after, for example, post-PCI. And so sometimes you may see the isolated RV infarction, but usually in most of the cases you would see it combined with the inferior STEMI. Let's move now to the posterior STEMI. Of course, we know that to diagnose posterior STEMI using 12 lead surface ECG and posterior ECG leads. 12 lead surface ECG we would show horizontal ST depression more than or equal 0.5 mm in V1 to V4, plus tall R wave with R S ratio more than 1, R wave duration more than 30 milliseconds, and upright T waves and this of course is considered to be the mirror image of the actual ECG pattern if the ECG lead were put on the posterior wall of the chest. So if you put the ECG lead in this way as V7, V8, V9 in this anatomical position would show us the actual ST elevation pattern of the posterior STEMI. So in this case I would see ST depression in V1 to V3 of more than or equal 0.5 mm with tall R wave and if I move the ECG to the posterior wall it would show ST elevation of more than or equal 0.5 mm in lead V7, 8 and 9 and this would diagnose posterior STEMI so it is like an ST segment elevation equivalent. So in this ECG for example we can see here that the patient has prominent R wave starting from V3 and maybe extending here till V6 suggestive of posterior STEMI and here if we put the ECG leads in V789 positions would show us ST elevation suggestive of posterior STEMI. Here in the 2017 ASC guidelines for STEMI, it would mention that the isolated posterior STEMI, which may occur in some cases, would be diagnosed as isolated ST depression more than or equal 0.5 mm in V1, V3, plus the ST elevation of more than or equal 0.5 mm in the posterior ACG leads. And of course, in the 2020 ESC guidelines for non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, it was mentioned that additional ECG leads for the right ECG and posterior ECG leads are recommended if ongoing schema is suspected when standard leads are inconclusive. And this is class one recommendation to detect STEMI patients. Let's now move to the famous and characteristic de Winter syndrome, in which there is upsloping ST depression plus hyper-QT waves and chest leads with the ascending limb of the ST segment starting below the isoelectric line. So the J point here is depressed. And of course, this is as unusual presentation of LED occlusion occurring in about 2% of cases. So it is not uncommon to see the de Winter syndrome pattern. So here in this ECG, there is hyper-QT wave with ST depression upsloping, of course. And this ECG example, we have the same upsloping ST depression with hyper-QT wave. And another example here of upsloping ST depression with hyperacuity wave diagnostic of the winter syndrome which is considered as anterior STEMI and should be scheduled for primary PCI regardless of the absence of ST elevation. Let's now move to the left bundle branch block. Of course it is difficult to answer this question is a chronic left bundle or acute left bundle but we can use this criteria in order to differentiate. Regarding the Scarboza criteria, we learned them before that each criterion has a number of points given if it is present in the ACG, 5 points, 3 points, 2 points respectively. And if the total point is 3 or more, it gives 90% specificity for diagnosis of STEMI. And the last criterion was modified to be a ratio of ST elevation measured as J point to the depth of the R wave rather than 
the magnitude or the absolute value of 5 mm and the ratio if it is more than 25% is suggestive of STEMI. And so this one was the last one to be modified in order to have the modified Scarbosa criteria for diagnosis of acute left bundle. And of course, the presence of concordant ST elevation in lead with positive QR deflection appears to be the best one to suggest ongoing myocardial infarction in case of left bundle. So, for example, if I have an ECG like this, the patient is having left bundle branch block, of course, I would apply the Scarposa criteria in order to show whether it is suggestive of acute left bundle or chronic left bundle together with the clinical presentation of the patient. There is also the Caprera sign, in which there is an, like a notching in the upward segment or the ascending limb of V2, 3, and 4. And of course, this is suggestive of acute left bundle. And we have the Chapman sign, in which there is a notch in the ascending limb of the positive complex in lead 1, AVL, and also in V6. And of course, this is suggestive of acute myocardial infarction. Although they are having low sensitivity because they are not very common to be seen, but if they are present, they have high specificity to suggest acute left bundle. Remember that ECG criteria help you in differentiating acute left bundle from chronic left bundle, but patient with clinical suspicion of ongoing infarction left bundle should be managed similar to the STEMI patient regardless of whether the left bundle branch block is previously known or not. So all the clinical sense precede the ECG criteria. Regarding the base rhythm, which usually you show left upon the branch block, it is difficult to interpret ST elevation in patients with ventricular pacing. And so the same criteria of acute versus chronic left bundle apply here in order to differentiate whether this base rhythm is acute left bundle or chronic left bundle. So for example, here this patient is having left upon the branch block, but he's having ST elevation in the inferior leads and some like slouching in the ascending limb of the complex in V2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so this patient is having anthroposterior STEMI on top of paced ventricular rhythm. And here in this patient, the patient is having also paced rhythm, but he have an evidence of ST elevation in V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so it is suggestive of anterior STEMI on top of paced ventricular rhythm. So you can rely in pace rhythm on the clinical presentation of the patient plus the ECG features that may suggest acute left bundle in this patient. And if the patient is not pacemaker dependent, you can have the programmer in order to turn off the pacemaker temporarily and check his intrinsic ECG. So for example, this patient here have the intrinsic rhythm showing ST elevation in the inferior leads when we turn off the pacemaker off temporarily. And here in this example, when I recorded V1, I detected an evidence of frank ST elevation. But if the patient is pacemaker dependent, of course, we cannot do this. Regarding the right bundle branch block, we know, of course, the presence of ST elevation in right bundle is suggestive of STEMI, and ST depression in lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6 are indicative of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And primary PCI should be considered, of course, if the patient is having persistent ischemic symptom in the presence of right bundle. So all the clinical sense precede and dominate the decision. So here, for example, in this patient, he's having right bundle branch block, but with ST elevation in V2, V3. So this be considered as anteroceptal STEMI plus right bundle branch block. And here in this example as well, we can see ST elevation from V1 to V5 together with the right bundle, suggestive of extensive anterior STEMI plus right bundle branch block. And I suspect that the culprit artery here was the LED proximal to the first septal perforator, and this gave origin to the acute right bundle branch block. And in the 2017 AC guidelines for STEMI, of course, they have put the Scarbosa criteria to differentiate it. And also, they have mentioned regarding the ventricular based rhythm that ACG may show left bundles that above rules apply to the paced rhythm as well. In the 2020 EC guidelines for management of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, they mention an important paragraph that more than 50% of patients presenting with acute chest pain and left bundle or right bundle would be found to have a diagnosis other than acute MI. And so, in this case, when the ECG is not suggestive and the clinical presentation is not convincing of ongoing ischemia, we can check the high sensitivity troponin at presentation and then follow up and also check the serial ECG in order to see whether there is dynamic change, the rise of marker, and so the need for revascularization or the static or the clinical presentation is static regarding ECG and markers are not elevated so we can keep on follow up. So all check the clinical sense, the serial ECGs with the markers in order to decide. 
Now we can move to the left main equivalent. Of course, we know that the stimulation of the carpet vessel in the left main equivalent is either the significant left main stenosis or occlusion or combined LD and LCX stenosis or occlusion. And its feature is presence of ST depression. More than or equal one millimeter in eight or more surface ECG leads, which are the end for lateral leads. And in some literature, only six leads are enough to diagnose it. And ST elevation in AVR and or V1 more than or equal one millimeter. The possibility is that the culprit is the left main, the multivessel coronary artery disease, culprit is both LED and LCX, or with proximal LED or LCX occlusion, and the occlusion in the other major left coronary artery that is filled by collaterals from the patent one. And of course, the another possibility is the diffuse subendocardial ischemia due to oxygen supply demand mismatch, like in case of post cardiac arrest or type 2 myocardial infarction. So, here we can have here that there is ST elevation AVR and V1 with ST depression in the inferolateral leads, which is diagnosis of left main equivalence. Another example here we can see the ST elevation in V1 AVR together with the inferolateral ST depression. So diagnostic of left main equivalent. And although in some patients may be a chronic ECG finding, as we mentioned before, that this patient should be considered as a STEMI and scheduled for primary PCI, as a culprit vessel can be found in many cases that needs urgent revascularization. Here, of course, if the ST elevation in more is more than AVR than V1, it is suggestive of left main lesion as a culprit vessel. And the ST elevation in AVR, if it is less or equal to the ST elevation V1, suggestive of proximal LED occlusion. And of course, they have put a paragraph for the left main equivalent in the 2017 AC guidelines to diagnose it, which is important to diagnose it as a STEMI and schedule the patient for revascularization. The problem is that sometimes the clinical presentation and ECG are not conclusive, and sometimes I don't see frank STEMI and I don't see any one of the previous patterns that we discussed in this lecture. So if the clinical presentation and ECG are not conclusive, Compare with previous ECGs if they are available, especially in patients with pre-existing ECG abnormalities in order to diagnose whether they are the same as before or they are new changes suggestive of ischemia, and of course, perform serial ECGs in the CCU or chest pain unit in case of persistent or recurrent symptoms or diagnostic uncertainty. So, of course, don't depend on one ECG, check previous ECGs or perform serial ECGs if they are not conclusive and the clinical presentation is not frank. So at the end of this lecture, we understood today some of the famous query ECGs that make confusion, but they are equivalent for STEMI, like the hyperacute T wave, posterior MI, RV infarction, the winter syndrome, acute left bundle and acute right bundle branch block, and left main equivalent. And our take-home message today, STEMI is a straightforward diagnosis through one ECG in the majority of cases, but it is confusing in some situations without frank ST elevation, and so you should be aware of them in order not to miss them the chance for successful revascularization. Thank you very much for your watching.